Hello, dirty devils. That's right. It's another episode of Trayvon. Trayvon. I'm Trayvon. Trayvon. We might be sounding a little bit different to you guys today because, well, guess what? We're in lockdown. And Where this is? is a very oh. special episode. Don't interrupt That's me, Dan. How dare, dare you, Derby? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's all gone to shit. I haven't introduced you yet. You don't exist. This is a very special episode. This is our first go at a video recorded episode with all three of us coming to you from our own homes spread right our across the lovely boxes. city of Sydney in our own little boxes. Um, look, my name is Jake Spear and I am joined, as always, by my two best buds, Double O Derby Deck. Trayvon! And the one and only, sound with the golden pun, who has a, car, a gun, a car and a drink, the grand champion, the Alpha and Omega, the Big Daddy O, the man, the myth, the legend, our MI6 expert in the field, Mr. Brandon McClellan. A little off book. R reporting for duty. There he is. There he is. Great. That's you all my titles time. that we earned in the um, in the special podcast that we've been doing that we haven't been releasing to listeners for the last eight yes, months. Yes, yes. Just for us. <laughs> <laughs> we have been a little quiet, boys. Why is that? We have. Uh, um, I have been. I was enlisted by um, by the government of Australia to. Um, I had to circumnavigate the globe to find a cure uh, for Lyme disease, and uh, we did it. Well done. Really good yeah. on you. I think that has a, they came up with a, a cure, but I'm sure your work was important. I think you're thinking of lemons disease. <laughs> <laughs> Lyme disease, up until now, there has not been a cure, but uh, we found it. Where did you find it? Where in the world did you find it? It was the last place you look. Um, oh. it, was, it was with my car keys. And my wallet. Uh, and my oh, wallet. Ah, see? Hey. What are the chances? Buried People have there. missed this, haven't they? Um, they certainly <laughs> have. Folks, we hope your week, as always, has been Trey Bond. Trey Bond. Trey Bond. Before we get too far down the track, Brandon... What is our mission today? Ah, Jake, I'm glad you asked that. Um, Thank you. I've got I've it in my most hand. Of the running, the running water today. What's that? Yeah, mate, I'm on fire. Yeah, I'm you're very good. Fire. Yeah, this very is good. um, this is strange. Well, look, it's 1959's Gold Fingies. Oh, I think I read a different one. Oh. 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 Well, that's. Yeah. Well, we'll see Jake, if they line you, up. Did you read? No, There's I time. can't read. Uh, you can't I, read. That's I still right. haven't learned. I haven't used yeah. my time in lockdown wisely. I'm still yeah. illiterate. So I listened to the audible recording uh, read by Hugh Bonneville, which was very nice. Yeah. I listened to the last uh, three chapters on audible. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> While I was playing Grand I'm Theft Auto reading. Online. <laughs> <laughs> Did did listening to uh, Hugh Bonneville and Goldfinger influence the way you were playing GTA Five? Did 100%. you all of a sudden? Yes, <laughs> I literally my my organize. I've started a, the business, the crew that you have to start in Grand Theft Auto is called Universal Exports. Oh my god! And so now I've got like a document forging business that's called uh, the Hildebrand Rarities. Like I've just gone full <laughs> Bondian kind of ridiculousness. Oh, that's only. fantastic. Gentlemen, yes. what? 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 do you hear that? Oh, I do declare it's fan mail. That's right. It's it's fan mail. It's fan mail. Fan it's mail. been so long since we've had fan mail. And, Jeez, and I bet it's banked right up. There's so many. We got five. <laughs> <laughs> five in eight months. Our, so, oh our, our mailroom clerks cannot handle this intake. Oh, I know. Mail doesn't stop. Um, so our, our first email is from Joshua Malta, and it's called Quantum of Solace Reimagined. Hi again, boys. During your completely understandable hiatus, I had a lot of time to let my Bond musings run rampant, and I kept coming back to one question that I realised could be fun to explore on the pod. I'm sure you have your own great answers for it already. Here is his question. 
If there was one entirely inconsequential thing in the entire Bond franchise you could change, what would it be? His answer is he would change another way to die over the titles in Quantum. He has no problem with Alicia Keys or Jack White individually, but the vocal mix on that octave harmony in the chorus is like oil and vinegar. They cannot blend, and it pulls me out of the entire experience like nothing else in the franchise. Pigeon double take is totally fine by comparison, in my opinion. His opinion, not mine. I've always hated it, but it wasn't until recently that I found a potential replacement. I stumbled on to this song by the now elderly Aaron Neville that just oozes Bond, Brassy, Bassy. Bassy. <laughs> uh, called the Bondulance. And on a whim, I used some incredibly basic video editing software to switch out the bad song for the good one. Here's the crazy part. It worked out way better than I could have possibly intended. Like it should not work this it? well at all. I am going to play it. Uh, I realise this isn't exactly great for the podcast medium. So he's got he's covering me here. I realise this isn't exactly great for the podcast medium, but I thought you three would enjoy it. And if you like it, feel free to share. Trey Bondingly, yours, trademark, Josh from Brooklyn. And allow me now to play for you a little bit of that thing. Yeah, that, that works quite well. I think so. What was he picturing it being played under? Quantum of Solace. Quantum of Solace. Mm. As the title sequence song. Yeah. He did mm. attach his own version of it where the 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 title sequence was playing <laughs> underneath yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but it would not open in the OneDrive link that he sent. So uh, maybe I'll put it in the podcast and uh, maybe I won't. <laughs> But I think that's quite good. What would yours be? Do you have an... In- I don't think that's really an inconsequential thing to change. I guess it's in- inconsequential to the plot of that film, but that's a massive change, I would argue. You're going to change film. a Bond song to a movie? Like, the Bond song... Well, he said if is- you can change anything, or does it have to be something... In- he in- said if there was one entirely inconsequential thing in the entire Bond franchise you could change, what would That's it be? Quite specific. Yeah, I would see him in court <laughs> on this. I think he could be sued for this. I think I'd take him to court. Yeah. No, because if he wants to know keys. what... I, I mean, my change would be quite consequential. I oh. think I think I would I think I would <laughs> the thing that I would change about the franchise is uh, is 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 give Laserby a second go, get Connery out of diamonds, put Laserby in diamonds, oh. and then I think you've just got a, a, a better better body of work. Do you make the same film, or is it a is it a different oh, film? I think there'd be some natural deviations. Yes, I think <laughs> they'd be pretty natural. <laughs> That as long as you keep the in gone. drag, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Keep that in. <laughs> That'll stay. Inconsequential. Yeah. What, uh, what could be inconsequential? Oh, look, I, I, know, I, think, th- I think throw inconsequential out. <laughs> 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 I, the, what one thing would you change, I think, is essentially it. Yeah, right. Oh, God. Um, Jaws returning in Moonraker? Ooh. Get rid of that. Yeah. See, again, yeah. consequential, but I, yeah, I, w- I would allow it. Look, mine's actually about Quantum of Solace. Um, mm. Mine would, would be, uh, oh boy, it's a, it's a dead heat for me. You either put No Good About Goodbyes as the title song by Shirley Bassey and, and David Arnold for Quantum of Solace, or... Oh, so you do the exact same thing as, as yeah. old Josh or, or, Katie, <laughs> or Katie Lang's Surrender is the title sequence song and Sheryl Crow's song is the end title song. 100%. That's exactly what I was going to add. If we go down this line of changing Bond songs, Surrender yeah. is in. Yeah, it's a big switch. And you don't have to get rid of Cheryl, but shy Cheryl, up the back. <laughs> back shy Tomorrow, Cheryl. In tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, in tomorrow. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Josh from Brooklyn. Um, Thanks for your inconsequential Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Oh, Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. Thank you for. Is your... that the one up the north coast? Uh, it could be. Oh, uh, yeah. There's a Brooklyn near Manly. 
Yeah, there I'm, is. I'm sure that's where he's writing from. <laughs> it's, it's the only famous Brooklyn. Got two hours north of here. And the only famous Brooklyn with a bridge. All right, we've got another one. It's called Bond Stuff uh, from oh. Alexander Flamenco. Oh, wow. Hi, Trey Bond. Bond. I hope you guys are doing well despite the challenging situation in New South Wales. In what have you doing, man? <laughs> yeah, it's been fine. In the spirit of sharing Bond stuff, I thought I'd pass along two photos that you may, may find interesting. Again, I'm going to have to send this through to you because we're not in the same room. Uh, number one, while sifting through the music section at a thrift store... I came across a CD of the Bond themes performed by the Golden State Orchestra. I'm not sure if this is an official release, but you'd probably have a better idea than me. The album cover highlights in a not-so-subtle manner a very particular aspect of the Bond franchise. Uh, how do I find oh it? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Where do I go? In the messages, oh. up the top, top left. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> They really highlight a um, particular aspect, don't they? A, uh, <laughs> I don't know where they got that logo from. Unlicensed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what's this Nightfire one? Uh, so, and then he says, number two, I decided to purchase and refurbish a PS2 back in January after the province wow. of Quebec introduced a strict lockdown. Uh, and I managed to pick up a copy of 007 Nightfire. I took a photo of the game booklet since it gives a glimpse of the French-Canadian release. Not sure anyone has what it takes to incarnate Bond if we take the literal translation. <laughs> take care and I look forward to your next episodes. Would love to hear you guys review Nightfire if you are planning to continue the game reviews in near future. Much love from Montreal, Alexander. Aha! Uh -huh. We will when we can, when yes. we're able. Quantum of Solace yeah, was a big nope. Yeah, that's yeah, a failed, shame. Failed I'm mission. very keen to explore these games, and Nightfire keeps getting Nightfire brought up again and again yeah. and again, and I've never played it. Mm. How are we going to play it? We're going to have to recondition a PS2 of our own. We must. Yeah. We must. Maybe that's our next thing. We refurbish old game consoles. There's a podcast in that. Yeah. There's definitely a podcast in there. Everything is content. <laughs> Always be streaming. That's it. All right, we've got one called Fan Mail is Forever. Ooh, this wow. is from, This is from another old friend. They've all been old friends. It's Techno Cryptic. Dear Jake, hey. dear Jake, Brandon and Darby, as the person who sent you your first piece of fan mail, that's canon, allow me to send you what might be your last question mark? Wait, excuse me? <laughs> oh, it's poison! <laughs> <laughs> it's a fugu, thing? fugu fish! It's anthrax. Thanks for a wonderful 50 episodes of Trey Bond. I truly enjoyed developing an unhealthy parasocial relationship with you all throughout 2020. Every week, it feels like Likewise. I was there with you, a group of four best mates talking about Bond, but one of them is silent and no one acknowledges their existence. That's right. But seriously, your chemistry was evident and infectious from episode one, much like coronavirus. And it's what yeah. I, and probably the five other listeners, all right, First yeah, of all, on. we are the number one podcast in the world. Oh, Edna. Yes, we are. <laughs> we, we beat Joe Rogan every week. Every week. <laughs> we get these numbers. And we don't even <laughs> release new episodes. We're swimming we in the ratings. <laughs> <laughs> Five listeners. How dare you? Uh, this cool. bloody guy. Anyway, he, keep, he rattles on. He kind of prattles on, really. Yeah. I think I've seen or heard just about every fact, tidbit and opinion about the Bond franchise So it was your friendship and humour that kept me subscribed Was it? That's what we suspected Yeah. I hope you're all well And I hope you also continue to create things together Whatever that might be For now I'll satisfy myself with the cooperatives content I found Trey hey. Bond by accident As a Bond lover But stayed because you were genuinely brilliant to listen to Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank Thanks, you, Scott. Scott. AKA Technocryptic. We we do have some more stuff coming. COVID has slowed us down. Yes. But it hasn't stopped us. 
Nothing. You just, you just bloody wait. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's one from Jason Burnett. I Oh, Sorry, yes. I see Technocryptic's uh, comments on YouTube all the time, and I just want to give him a little bonus point. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Ha have, have it noted. Just a bonus point. Bonus point for uh, Technocryptic. Bonus point. Point of order. Noted. Brilliant. Day player of the week? Maybe. Day, potentially. We'll have to call YouTube about that. Can you that. hear my chair creaking? Is that... Not at all. It? No, it's oh, just now your I old can. bones and joints. You can? All right. <laughs> uh, Jason Burnett says... Moonraker slash general comments. Gentleman. That's what he wrote. I've said it before, <laughs> but I will say it again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love your show. Three more times. He said. I need your show. And I am so glad you are back. Sadly, oh. I am a slow reader. So am I. I'm currently working <laughs> on diamonds after having recently completed Moonraker. He's a very slow reader. <laughs> very slow reader. Jake doesn't even read. He, he, yeah, he's so a slow I, don't know. I don't know how you're doing it. I'm marvelling at it. <laughs> like lightning. <laughs> I went back to listen to your Moonraker novel episode and you mentioned how wonderful you thought the scenes were that took place in Blades. And I believe Brandon asked if that longing for such a place existed in America. Those were yeah. by far all ex uh, capitalized my favorite parts of the novel and i think i can safely speak for all americans when i say yes we want that kind of exclusivity within some aspect of our lives <laughs> i frequently daydream about winning or earning i guess but more likely winning enough money to establish my own club such as blades uh, your, you three will have an established membership to come anytime you like, and I can't wait to see you there one day. Best wishes, Jason, Charlottesville, Virginia, U.S. You well, better bloody deliver on that there, Jason. My, my, my. That I can't wait to go to Charlottesville and go to this club. Yeah, we're going to What's the Burnett really Club. Jason the Burnett. Burnett club is cool. I think it's got a nice ring to it. The Burnett the Club's good. Right. That's nice. Yeah, I'll them. see you at the Burnett. Yes. I'll, I'll see you at the Burnett. I have steak at the Burnett. We'll play some cards at the Burnett. <laughs> I hope they don't burn it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. This one is called uh, hashtag VBCX2020 hashtag payment from P who Camo. Is this an invoice that you didn't what? pay? Invoice ID. 360 Norton PC protection. Hello, consumer. Yeah. It is to inform you that so, your you know, buy... This one, oh, this one <laughs> Sorry. I don't think is fan mail. I don't think this is fan mail. Let me just finish might... here because I I know it's a strange name, but I, I think we should hear them out. It's not. It's the name, but it's also the subject and the opening line seems like it might be... Yeah, but be they've all been a bit weird, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> So it is to inform you that you buy yearly product subscription for total all-round security and maintenance with us. The 360 Norton PC protection has been auto... Oh, it's fine, yeah. This is an invoice. Are we going to be okay? Yeah, Do we're we okay. Pay somebody That's something? an invoice. That's an invoice. We'll cut around that. That's an invoice. How yeah. does that... So, yeah. so we've only got four fans. It was just four. four. Of them. It was just four. Just four. Oh. One every two months. Yeah, okay. Number one podcast in the world. That's more frequent than our episodes have been. Uh, it's a hundred percent right. <laughs> <laughs> we Jeez, also, these guys really slacked off. We don't have Norton. <laughs> yeah, we don't have we Norton. We did fifty. This so, is this is scam. This is scam. 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 I don't remember signing up to Norton. Fishing. That's a phishing email. That's right. Gone fishing. Well, there you are. That's fan mail. Hey. Hey. Well, before we get too far down the track. I'd just like to say it's time for everyone's favourite segment. It's give the people what they, what want. they want. What they want. Oh, it's back. It's back, baby. Bigger and better than ever. Been on high A to us. But how, how long until people are going to see the, uh, the result of this one? Um, that's part of the game. Okay. That's, that's one of the games. <laughs> Oh, God. What is this going to be? Right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. We've got three contenders for you today for Give the People What They Want. What game 
Uh, what original inspired Trey Bond official trademark uh, game will you select for next episode? Games? The games. You're going with the more of a game thing now. More of a game. More of a game feel today. Not just segments. Well, yeah, more of a game. More. Of, it's a game, right? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. All right. So here's here's number one for you. Number one is called Bonds James Bonds. Oh boy. Bonds Bonds James Bonds. Right? Yep. Bon, Bonds James Bonds. Let yes. me guess. Something to do with undies. Something no. to do with undies. Oh, no. All right. All right. No. You've impressed James me. James Bond. James Bond is it's not rental history. the only James Bond who has achieved great exploits. Oh. You must correctly guess these achievements of other James Bonds throughout history. Correctly guess what? Wait, are the questions just going to be, what did James Bond do? He was an ornithologist. No, he was a rock climber. You're confusing him with James Bond. (laughs) James Bond. (laughs) That's exactly how the game is played. Or is every answer simply James James Bond? James Bond? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Who actually discovered a cure to penicillin? Oh, James oh, Bond. James Bond. James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> Incorrect. It was... No, it was Ian Fleming. Incorrect. It was Alexander Fleming. A trick question. <laughs> <laughs> Game number two. All right. How's this one for you? Mr. Moneypenny. Mr. Moneypenny. Mist the Moneypenny? No, Mr. As opposed to Mr. Miss. Yeah. This is a game of logistics and puzzle solving. Oh dear. You must determine the current task, appointment, or whereabouts of MI6 staff members based on clues from Money Penny's daily diary. <laughs> You've got this what plan. You You've got this planned. No, I got this planned out to a team. This, this is, is a Hasbro style board game. <laughs> this, this is a board game. It's proper. <laughs> Hey, look, I'm thinking long term. I'm thinking merch. I'm thinking a partnership with Mattel or Hasbro. Why is it Mr. Money, Benny? Because it's, it's you guys doing it. Oh, I thought it was because it was you. Well, no, no, no. You guys have to kind of compete with are you as good as the greatest secretary of all time, Miss Money Penny? You have to become oh, Mr. Man, Money man. Penny. And you have to use the clues that are set out in her uh, journal, her, day, her, her daily appointment booklet. About are you going to write this? Yeah, 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 yeah. A it's full journal. A yeah, full yeah. Book. It's going to be like little clues for you to go, well, hang on, if he's here at this time and then he's having lunch here and then he's got a massage there and then he's at Blades here tonight, so where is he now? Are we going to see this if we're doing <laughs> virtual stuff still? Uh, we'll, we'll wing it. We'll figure it out. If it oh. wins, it's got to get voted first. That's it's got true. to get voted for. It's true. Yeah. Exactly. Might not. Tell you what might get voted in. Oh, yeah. This little ditty I like to call... Pleasure in what I eat. <laughs> what? Pleasure in what I eat. Okay, and it's a ditty. This is a, no, this is a game. <laughs> yeah, sing it, sing right. a tune for us, sing a bar. <laughs> <laughs> this is a game where you must correctly guess these Bondian meals based purely on a list of their ingredients. Oh. What, let's guess the name of the meal. Yes. You have to no. guess what Bond meal it is <laughs> based on the list of its ingredients. That's the game, Darby. I don't know any names of any meals. Pasta. <laughs> Spaghetti bolognese. Well, see, you'll have oh, yeah. to do a bit of research, won't you, if it gets voted in. Folks, that's give the people what they want. They're the three games. Number one, oh. Bonds, James Bonds. James Bonds With... throughout history. Yeah. Mr. Money Penny. A game of logistics and puzzle solving. Mm. Extravagant. Oh, Bonds, James Bond, because there's more than one. Because there's more than one. Yes. I get it. Yes. I thought there was some sort of possession thing you were trying to... No, out. no apostrophes. <laughs> it's all plural. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Mr. Money Penny is game number two. Game number three. Pleasure in what I eat. Which is a Bond quote from Casino Royale. Uh, well, it's I take great pleasure a ridiculous pleasure yeah. yes yes yeah. yes yes well you know do you think it, you can't fit that as a title but actually on that if we're going to, just to workshop a title here <laughs> yeah <laughs> pleasure in what i eat uh i don't see how that relates to the game 
because essentially we're playing Recipe Guesser. Recipe Guesser, that's a good name. That's a terrible name. Well, it's not Bondian, yes. <laughs> but it's not a terrible name. I'll see you in court. <laughs> no, the titles merely allude to the general theme of the game. Right. In this Dave, case, are we going to food. talk about the fact that you're in a Sinead O'Connor clip? Here? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't at all. This is this I is my. You keep seeing your hands come in, and they're just these like fleshy sort of floating things, floating in space. It's a drama school movement piece. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been studying French mime. <laughs> in all right, are we done with that? The people yeah. vote on the thing. So all right, that's what's on the cards. I want to. I want to see some votes, and we're going to figure episode... out which game we're going to play. 0054 sometime <laughs> next year. Yeah, coming <laughs> coming to a cinema but, near you. <laughs> all right, well, gents, look, bloody, here's one for you. Oh! It's going to be so hard to sledge and interrupt with this delay. Yeah, yeah I'll make you feel really bad about it if you do it. So. That's true. Yeah. All right, previously on Death by Otto's Fixation... Having chased Otto Doss and the Scandexan up a twisting mountain path in a desperate attempt to rescue Patricia and her new friend, the Queen. Uh, and this is a really good episode, actually, I, I must say. Brandon's chapter 11 of Death by Otto's Fixation. Oh, I think very much. If we much. were to do a, a ranking episode of the chapters, that would be up there for me. Oh, come, come, Mr. Bond. So listen, 0052, give it a listen. It's, that's a plug. That's an inside plug. All right. Um... But James Bond arrives too late as the group take off in a helicopter. Then he goes and jumps off a bloody cliff and he, he grabs onto the landing strut of the helicopter. And then Patricia, you all remember Patricia, of course, uh, she uses the distraction to slit the throat of the Scandexan. Uh, and then she tries, I don't know if she'd had flying experience, that was a bit vague, but she did a pretty good job of jumping in behind the controls uh, of the chopper. And so, now inside the chopper, the Queen's been sedated at this point. Um, Bond and Doss have a final tussle, but the Austrian is no match for the ruthless 00 agent. Back on safe ground and a, and a revived Queen Elizabeth II reveals her, satis uh, reveals, reveals her satisfaction with the success of Operation Royal Mail, a mission apparently involving the Admiral, who you'll remember uh, was suspected of some kind of treachery, collusion with DOS. Dirty um, the, That's right. Dirty air. Yeah. The Queen now permits James Bond to kill Otto Dus, DOS, which he duly does <laughs> by me. sending him off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now currently on. And it was a really 12. great line. It was a really great line. Which one is that? I hope you can. How long can you hold your breath? And as he breath. kicks him <laughs> off. <laughs> My other favourite line from that chapter is where the Queen walks out of the chopper and she goes, the saline swap was a simple <laughs> confidence trick. <laughs> you got to listen to it. I'm telling you. Great episode. All right, this is the final chapter of uh, Death by Otto's Fixation. My God. And the chapter title is An Epilogue with an Old Friend. Ooh. One week later. And Ian Fleming's James Bond 007 finds himself caught in traffic on the miserable, rain-soaked streets of London. A far sight from the tropical Cairns resort he'd been lounging in with Patricia since the ghastly affair with Otto Doss. All expenses paid by good old Lizzie, of course. Despite the dreary weather, he was happy to be out of Australia and home at last, and truth be told, more than a little relieved to be done with Patricia's unfortunate accent. Having landed at Heathrow only a few hours prior, he was on his way to the office to see M. It would, it would mark his first appearance at MI6 since before the Roxbury incident, and he quietly expected a hero's welcome. Of course, M had some serious explaining to do, but Bond's unwavering faith in the old coot meant he would have some solid answers soon. For now... <coughs> For now, he allowed himself to stare lazily out through the foggy passenger window at the many Londoners, at the many Londoners out facing the cold and the death. He breathed a deep breath. Now in M's office, and it seemed the weather was forcing a similarly reflective mood on the ad ad admirable, admirable admiral. <laughs> <laughs> he sat with his back to James, 
staring out through the wide picture frame windows being lashed with wind and rain. He turned to face Bond now, resolve gathered. It's good to see you, James. Likewise, Admiral, as ever. You seem to have made the Queen very happy. All part of the job, sir. You know, they wanted to give you the Order of Australia, of course. Her Majesty was all for it. I had to remind her, of course, that it wouldn't be in the Crown's best interest. You're the last double O now, of course. Understood, sir. Bond could, Bond could sense M's thoughts drifting to the rain once more. I guess I owe you an explanation. James waited, patient and kind. You see, we lost contact. When we lost contact with the double O's back at the Red Slug raid, we feared the worst. Doss got in touch and he confirmed our fears and he wanted to talk with me. You see, James, in exchange for his safe passage to Australia, he offered me something unlikely, something I couldn't refuse. In that moment and in your absence, I thought to myself, what would 007 do? Bon was confused, hoping the fog surrounding the old man's ramblings would soon clear. M could sense this now and his eyes took on a darker stare. Perhaps it's best if I just show you. They got a uh, cut. There's a cut here. Oh, yes. They got out of the elevator at the basement level, M leading the way down a long corridor. He was silent, working, walking, working, walking, with a purposeful stride <laughs> that for some reason felt ominous as it bounced off the concrete walls. They came to a thick steel door, not a stick steel door, right at the end of the corridor an armed guard stationed outside. James hadn't spent much time in the MI6 basement, but he'd heard whispers of its true purpose besides storing archived files. It had earned the nickname The Dungeon for a reason. The guard moved aside quickly for him and Bond, swiping his electronic pass and swinging the big door open. My dear James, what a pleasure indeed. Bond's mouth fell open. Standing on the other side of the thick plexiglass, dressed in grey prison pyjamas and hands tightly cuffed, mm -hmm. was none other than Redwood Roxbury. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe where I've been. <laughs> and that's it. Oh, get oh. out of here. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> oh, no. This <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> Three word he review. Big bad all along. <laughs> oh, Three word review. Okay. I've got one. We'd fixed this. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I've got four words for you. Can't do it. Get rid Why of Why not? One. Get rid of, Get rid of one. Take one out. Had such promise. Ooh. What was the word you were going to have? What word did you Stop. drop? It. <laughs> it? Oh, come it, on. It, it had <laughs> such, How it did had you not know promise. to drop that word? Well, it was either that or promise. <laughs> it had so. <laughs> no, it had much. It had such. <laughs> it had such. It could have been that. <laughs> well, Jake, you get to start the next book, mate. Oh, Ooh, wow. that's very dangerous, Darby. That's a lot of. <laughs> Look, Did I you hear this last line because there was a lot of there was a lot of laughing. His last line. His last line. He said, "You wouldn't believe where I've been." Yes, I heard that. Yes. And I, How? I don't know what you're trying to bending do here, the Darby. Timelines. You bending are bending the timeline. Marvel can do it. <laughs> you know, the multiverse. Yeah. Yeah. Enter the Trey Bondverse. Yeah. This We're... is the Trey Bondverse. That's, I guess that's what we are. The ties that bind, whatever this, this long saga is, it's essentially just we are to the Bond cinematic universe what Loki <laughs> and WandaVision. We're the Loki and WandaVision of the Bond universe. Just with no official ties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we yeah, do exactly. directly affect what happens in the cinematic universe. In They're listening. In the they are consequential. listening. Number one yeah. podcast in the world. Hello, Barbara. 
Hello, everyone. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Thailand, the President of the Ukraine. I mean, everyone is listening. Everyone's listening. here. And I gotta say, guys, don't be afraid to write in. We want yeah, to hear use from the you. official channels. Yeah. Uh, there's yes. only five of you, apparently. Apparently. But if you each, there should be enough. If you just keep like Techno Cryptic, just yeah. keep sending in more messages every day. And then Tell us how your day's like been. Hot. Yeah, more more people. Yeah, I want to hear a I want to hear a fan mail of like just a day in the life of someone. Hmm. I don't, hey Trayvon, I woke up this morning at 7am, I had burnt toast and marmalade and uh, a glass of milk and uh, I woke up my cat and yeah, then no, I, I, don't I think went this, to work. Uh, yeah, no, leave that. I don't didn't mind that stuff. though. You didn't? Uh... I think the best th the thing that could have been changed though is if they had woken up and had scrambled eggs. You know, keep it Bond related, I guess. Just make sure if your day is about Bond, tell me all about it. Yeah. Hey, that's just my two cents. What do I know? I'm just one of the co-hosts of the most listened podcast uh, in the world. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're moving on to this this little baby. Oh, I, is that out. okay? I'm not even sure if that's okay. I don't think, for... I don't you, think you can. <laughs> there needs to be some censoring there. I've got some bullet holes in mine. Oh, speed holes. In a high, high speed chase. It's been annoying because... A lot of words on the pages are missing. But oh, I no, oh. they've been, <laughs> they've been shot out. Of hole goes, come. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, we didn't do a preconceived notions for this one. We just kind of dove in, didn't we? We did. Dubbed. We dove. We dove. We dubbed in. Um, so let me read the back of the uh, of the Penguin Classics edition. Well, do you have any do you have any preconceived notions before we? Uh, my, I've, my... Got, I've got some preconceived. Oh notions. yeah, go go. Because mine is way too read... coloured by the fact that I've read it now. Well, no, see, this isn't about the book. Oh. Well, it is about the book. I get you. I think, I think that Brandon loved this shit. <laughs> Oh. oh yes. My, that's my only preconceived notion. The yeah. whole way through, I was going, "This is this is this is a Brandon. <laughs> this, one, <laughs> this one's a Brandon." <laughs> I thought that I before I picked this book up, I was I was you didn't hoping... pick it up, Jay. You didn't pick up any. You haven't picked up a book since high school. I picked up <laughs> <laughs> the last last book I picked up was Run Spot Run. And it took me about six months to get through. It's a tome. Um, but I picked up my iPhone and I logged into my Audible account and I downloaded the audiobook for Goldfinger. And before I did that, I thought, geez, I hope this is going to be good because it's been a long time since I've uh, been immersed in, a, in an Ian Fleming novel. Well, it's and... just on that. What because we didn't like Doctor No. Not so much, no. That was the last one. We were a little cold, but we did like From Russia, the one prior. Yeah. Did enjoy From Russia. I think Where I've liked all the this? odds. I've liked all the oh. odds and I haven't liked all the evens. I like the really, yeah, that's a pretty good. I go the thing on that off sticks on in my off head for me. It's hey, just stop. Shut, shut the up. fuck up. <laughs> Excuse me, just I cannot take, 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 take. both of you. Just literally, I just have something I'd like to add to the conversation. Please go. No. That Harry. is, I just cannot shake how much I hated diamonds. Diamonds, oh, you're still stuck on yeah. diamonds. That was a while ago. I'm surprised you remember it. I know. Well, I don't really. I just remember the feeling that I had, which was like hate. And um, this is the one with the spangled, the spangled gang. The spangled, the spangled gang. The spang gang. Yeah, and the big, yeah. the, the western, kooky western town. Yeah, yeah, yeah the with the locomotive. Spectacular. Yeah, I didn't care for that very much. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I had a good feeling about this one. I was just, I was hoping more than anything. But I think you would be onto something there, Brando, with your, with your odds. The only contrary point is that I didn't mind Living Let Die but I think I just have a bit of a soft spot because of its tone. That's right, yes yeah, I wasn't yeah. as hot on yeah. Live and Let Die. Yeah, yeah but it's still a lesser one, whereas you're right, Casino Royale, great Live and Let Die, uh, Moonraker fantastic, Diamonds not so good, Polish from it. Russia from Russia, fantastic, Doctor No probably the weakest 
maybe tied with diamonds so oh, far. Diamonds are still so, my least favorite. I hated yeah. diamonds so much. <laughs> so we're, we're on an odd. We're on an odd. We number. are on an odd. I will say, funnily enough, Jake's uh, PC. Good for listening. Oh, you look great. Yeah, it's very nice. I think everyone looks good from that angle. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. You don't uh, seem to be able to do it. The Trademark uh, <laughs> book, book Club. <laughs> Gold figure. It's already gold figure. Yeah. Um, I was nervous about the fact that, that this book is pretty much entirely set in America. That was making me nervous because I remember Ian Fleming, his previous Americanisms have been atrocious. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if I yeah. could do another one. Um, yeah. Only the, back, only the back part is set in America, is it? Pretty much, yeah. And the, the front yeah, yeah. as well, I guess. Oh, yeah. At yeah. the Fontainebleau. In, in- yeah, planting. Florida. Yeah. Um, well, let me read you the back of the uh, the Penguin Classic. Please do. Auric Goldfinger, cruel, clever, frustratingly careful, a cheat at canasta and a crook on a massive scale in everyday life, the sort of man James Bond hates. So it's fortunate that Bond is the man charged by both the Bank of England and MI5 to discover what Goldfinger, the richest man in the country, intends to do with his ill-gotten gains, and what his connection is with Smirsch, the feared Soviet spy-killing corps. But once inside this deadly criminal's organisation, 007 finds that Goldfinger's schemes are more grandiose and lethal than anyone could have imagined. Not only is he planning the greatest gold robbery in history, but mass murder as well. Spoilers. Spoilers. That's a good, that's a good little it's a good blurb. blurb. I would buy that book if I was just yeah. him and that. Yeah. And Brandon, Brandon, what were the critics of the time saying? That's an excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. Busy. Reviews of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Writing in the the of the, 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 the we're gonna go back. Writing in the Observer, Maurice Richardson thought that quote, Mister Fleming seems to be leaving realism further and further behind and developing only in the direction of an atomic, sophisticated sapper. Uh, sapper for anyone who doesn't know is the guy that wrote the um. Jeez, what were they called? Bulldog Drummond novels. Those kind of young young male adventure things, full of uh, full of um, well, fascism. <laughs> like the Hardy, the Hardy Boys. Uh, yeah, but think more like fascist. <laughs> like Nazi, Nazi youth. They weren't boys. Nazi. He was he was British, and I'm sure people will. I'll get mail for this, but he does. He has been criticised since the end of World Dubai War Two. Uh, yeah, well, it was after World War Two. People started going, "What? What is this?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it, it's becoming more of an atomic, sophisticated sapper, and that Fleming, even with his forked tongue, tongue, tongue rather, sticking right through his cheek, remains maniacally readable. In the Manchester... Maniacally readable. Yeah, maniacally readable. They were just throwing all sorts of adjectives at this review. (laughs) In the Manchester Guardian, Roy Perrault, or Perrot, observed that Goldfinger will not let Bond's close admirers down, and that Fleming is again at his best when most sportingly buchanish as in the motoring pursuit across Europe. Uh, Buchanish, I think he means uh, Buchan, the, the writer who did those adventure stories, like the um, the 39 Steps. You're oh. just a fountain of knowledge. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> a fountain <laughs> blur six of knowledge. Expert in the field. Oh, look at Well, I've got to give you something to fact check. No, you don't. Yes, I do. He's not going to do it even if you... If you <laughs> yes, he bloody will. There'll be a riot start. with the number one <laughs> listened podcast in the world. <laughs> don't fact check that, though. Um, <clears throat> he summarised the book by saying that it was hard to put down, but some of us wish we had the good taste just to try. 
which I thought was Ooh. sad. I put it there. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a good little line. Ooh, Ooh, no, no, I'm a deviant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the Times Literary Supplement, Michael, ah, Michael Robson Robert. wrote that I quote, take mine every day. Yeah, me too. It's a big pill. Um, a new bond has emerged from these pages. An agent more relaxed, less promiscuous, less stagily muscular than of yore. Robson added that the story too is more relaxed and saw this as a positive development but it did mean that although there are incidental displays of the virtuosity to which Mr. Fleming has accustomed us, accustomed us, the narrative does not slip into Top Gear until Goldfinger unfolds his plan. And our good friend Anthony Boucher, writing for the uh... New York Times, appeared to enjoy Goldfinger, saying, okay. The whole preposterous fan fantasy strikes me as highly entertaining. And I want to just take a little bit of umbrage at Anthony, Anthony Boucher. I know we're only halfway through these um, Bond novels, but there's this yeah. mystique around Anthony Boucher that he's some kind of like anti-Fleming, anti-Bond guy. That. Well, it's I online think. too. He's, he oh. loves every one of these fucking books. <laughs> He's, he's more that. on him than we are. Now, <laughs> uh, sick. Yeah, someone. He's got a good publicist. We what we now. What, what's that? What did Anthony say? What oh, he, he say said uh, he said the whole preposterous fantasy strikes me as highly entertaining. All right. I've been meaner to ex-girlfriends. <laughs> you have. I have. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what this episode is no, for. No, that's true. <laughs> Jump into the modern reviews. Jeez, people are... Go oh, God, I don't know. No, we'll keep it in. <laughs> <laughs> Simon MacDonald believes... Uh, and that's reviews by Simon, by the way. Believes that, quote, not only is Goldfinger a brilliant, enthralling spy novel capped with thrills, dastardly villains and audacious action, but here, more than ever... 007 is presented as a complex individual, not just the callous, sardonic killer for queen and country, but a man who, like the rest of us, suffers from an inner turmoil, whose prospen pr 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 get it together, whose prospensity for death has darkened <laughs> his psyche. <laughs> you have to really start the show, babe. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Goldfinger is highly recommended for spy fans, anglophiles, and all retro-loving souls who wish they drove a Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost just like Auric Goldfinger wrote April Chase for Curled Up. And finally... That's a modern review. That is, yes. These have all been modern since the last one. <laughs> so just two. <laughs> And finally, <laughs> oh, it's hot in here, isn't it? <laughs> finally, the wonderful Calvin Dyson thought yeah, it was yeah. a good read and recommended it, but he found the homophobic and racist content in the novel to be very distasteful. Although he did say, uh, just to be fair to him, he was he said that the lack of irony in any of the kind of racist and homophobic homophobic moments he kind of went because there is no irony irony oh, <laughs> irony in them <laughs> um, oh, they're just pretty flagrant well he yeah he kind of went it because they're so they just feel so like out there and said he's just like you can't take it seriously because you're just like this this man is a <laughs> disgrace i'm not going to be offended by this he clearly has no wit <laughs> he's crazy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah he's a, a buffoon an oaf so that's what everyone else uh, reckoned. What do you reckon? Oh, do you really want to know? I do. <laughs> I, that's why we're here. Yeah. Look, I, I thought this was pretty damn good. I'm with you. I'm with you. Look I thought this was a pretty damn good read. Fellas, we're back and it's three for three. I thought this was pretty oh. good. Pretty damn good. I thought it was what pretty good. Is it for, uh, yeah, this week, boys? yeah that thanks. was easy. Top five next week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did. I thought this was good. 
yeah it was pretty cool it um it took me by surprise i think and uh yeah i was very hesitant to pick up another one of these mm. really i thought i uh, after dr no even though we'd had some negative negative experiences prior after dr no i really was done i really felt a little bit like ah yeah i don't know if i can do more of this i, I think it's kind of given me everything and although this one to me felt a little bit like um familiar in a sense that uh more formulaic from ian fleming than we'd probably seen before in that but i don't know if that's just more because we're at the point now where we're quite familiar with these novels you know what i mean and with this yeah. with the structure that he uses and whatnot but i liked that yeah he he um i don't know it just it felt like a nice mature way into the story and it felt like a bit of a palate cleanse after dr no and it was it didn't upset me all that much there were a few racist homophobic more than more than enough um this time around and i think you know the ire that i feel towards that is it just it gets more it is it's like calvin says it's kind of like you don't even know what to do when you read these comments it's, yeah it's like and should i just ignore this can i ignore this is this like they're in they're, these statements are in no way important to the narrative but they are constant but yeah, that's my babbling <laughs> immediate reaction. <laughs> I think but what I appreciated strong. so much about this one for me was that it was at least for the most part in the beginning, the way that I was sort of seduced into it was that it was a real detective story for me. It felt like a real detective bond. And I mm. appreciated the slow burn aspect of figuring out who Goldfinger was. The fact that we start, you know, with Bond catching a plane and we get sort of the tail end of, of his last job, you know, this, the, 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 the heroin kind of trade and all of this sort of stuff yeah. and, and running into DuPont and this card game unraveling. And I think the familiar aspect for me came more so from really vivid images of the film, particularly when we got to the, the Fontaine Bleu and the, and the, um, Jill Masterton stuff. Ah, yeah, Jill Masterton stuff. Um, but there was some interesting stuff to begin with. I thought, oh, Bond in this was really quite prickly and terse from, from time to time. And it did feel different. I can't remember what a uh, critical reviewer said, that it did, did feel like a, a, a slightly different James Bond there were times I was getting real flashes of like a, a modern Daniel Craig esque kind of portrayal of the character. And then I'd be flashing back to a, a kind of classic suave Connery. But I think if I'm being honest, I, I have a feeling that I actually enjoyed the first half of the novel more so than I did the second half, even though that the climax was sort of driving to that end point. Those scenes at the at the Fountain Bleu and um, the golf game, oh, hell and yeah. the, you know the the meal with with Dupont and everything like that. I was just I was really in love with that kind of stuff. And for me, I haven't read a great deal of spy novels, um, whether you know Le Carre or, or you know Fleming's um, contemporaries or otherwise more more modern spy novels. So all I'm really speaking to is the fact that I've read a, a handful of other Fleming books. Um, but for me, I thought this was one of his better ones. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I thought the the first part of it, um, yes, before he got captured. Once he got captured, um, I, I, mercifully, it's actually very, very quick. It's the quickest he gets through. And like once he got captured, I was like, oh boy, we've got so much more to go. And then I was kind of like, oh no, I really don't. There's very little left in the book once he gets captured. Um, but I, yeah, once he got captured, I was a bit like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. 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 I remember the movie. Okay. Let's, let's keep yeah. going. Um, I, yeah, the setup, it was very patient, wasn't it? The setup, very, very patient. patient kind of way into the story. And, and for some reason, even though, you know, I expected to grow, uh, tired with the patience it was taking because we knew where we were going to end up, but despite knowing that what Goldfinger's up to. 
And despite being a step ahead, ahead of Bond, so to speak, it was still really enjoyable to see how he worked things out more in that detective sort of fashion. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I it, It's a funny thing when, like, as we've read a, a couple of times, reviewers have said, oh, it's a very different Bond, like with different novels. Like, I feel like there's this constant thread that keeps popping up for me where it's like, oh, he's a very different Bond. He's a very different Bond, isn't he? And part I of me, think so. uh, no, because part of me thinks mm. the more I read these, the more I kind of go, Bond isn't particularly complicated in these. He's a very blank slate that I think particularly male readers put their own personality into. He gives you just enough of a little like thing to be like, have you ever felt like this? And then you go, yes, I have. Or if you yeah. haven't, it's you kind of go, oh, that's life. something else. Yeah, it's it's this yeah. thing where yeah. he's a he's a good vessel for the audience that uh, I find. He doesn't, I never, re- and I think that's evident in the fact that I don't see the same bond from go to woe in, in any of these stories. I keep seeing either a fictionalized version. I see myself sometimes. I see Roggie. I see Sean. I see Daniel. Like I see all of those kind of things. Um yeah, I, I I don't know. I'm not saying that is what Fleming does, but I, I do find it strange that every time we go through these like contemporary reviews of the time, they're always like, oh, so different, and we're seeing such a new Bond. And I was like, I, are we? I didn't think we no, were. I think, I think we've learned all we really can about Bond at this point. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, he is a nice... He's a nice mirror, for sure. I mean, the, the circumstance felt a little different, but at the same time, I really kind of... The way in was very much like Moonraker. I mean, I thought that yeah. was a little bit blatant, <laughs> to be honest. The fact that he was bringing another card cheating villain in in a similar fashion, but he did approach it. That's why this one feels a little more mature, because he did approach it with a different sort of... It was Bond wasn't so brash about, I guess, about trying to yeah. uncover what was going on. He was a little more playing the secret. But again, the thing is that I, I get a little frustrated with the Flemings. And I guess it's it's hard because I'm always kind of going, where does the reader sit in this sort of, yeah. um, in this transfer of knowledge and where does he want the reader to sit? And I always find that Bond, either Bond or one of the characters is too stupid. And that is what frustrates me. And in this one, it was Goldfinger. Oh. Goldfinger was... Although we made great pains to, to point out that he's very smart and cunning and yada, yada, yada. It's like, if he's all those things, what's he doing this for? You know, why doesn't he just kill Bond yeah. instead of keeping him around? I could do you your know? taxes for you. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I could be your secretary. Hmm. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Bond, you should be my assistant. That's exactly what I need. <laughs> Turn the table, yeah. saw off. <laughs> that was my main. <laughs> yeah, that was my main thing, my main qualm. Where I was like, Bond is playing it well. He doesn't know more than he should. And, yeah. Um, and, and and yeah, he's sitting in a pretty consistent level to the reader. Um, but yeah, Goldfinger, especially. Look, I'm jumping around a bit, but also the constant expecta- uh, suspicion that he's a part of Smirsh, even <laughs> though they have no evidence. Yeah. You know, there's no actual evidence to suggest that he is part of Smirsh, yeah. but Fleming and M and Bond all rely on this sort of idea that he he is. They go straight Smirsh. to it. Oh, he's they the wealthiest man in the world. Oh, all this gold business, he must be funding Smirsh. Exactly. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. But if that was the case. Wouldn't Goldfinger have checked with Smirsh and seen if there was any man named James Bond on there? You know? Yeah. Which he yeah. does know, in like the, the last 10 pages the of the last, book. Yeah, it's the like, that's end. why you're on this plane, Mr. Bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It stunk a little bit to me, that, that side of the plotting, but, yeah. but I appreciated it and stayed with the sort of patient approach and the, you know, the cookie crumb kind of following the, the cookie crumb trail really uh, there was a yeah. there was a big big part of me that kind of felt that 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 whole card cheating thing and and the oh it's dupont from casino royale and they just cross paths and he's like oh i remember you you're bloody good at cards could you help me figure this that was cool i was that like was that's really cool. really cool 
And I was yeah. kind of hoping we didn't go back to MI6. Yeah. Because there was a big part of me going, great, give me, even if this is just a short story, give me holiday. just this. This story of he yeah. ran into that guy. And then I was reading that bloody um, Ian Fleming letters book. And oh, yeah. that's what the he initially thought he didn't have an idea for a full story. And so he was like, was oh, yeah, I'd just that. do this short story. And then he was like, oh, well, that's the beginning of Goldfinger. And then he wrote all the other stuff after, um, which I thought was strange. But I, I, I agree. The, the, the thing of going back to M and MI5 or MI6, whatever they're called, and then them being, oh, but it might be Smirsh and the Bank of England is trying to track this. I was like, that's so unnecessary. Like, I kind of loved the idea that he just bumped into this guy who was like, I'll pay you a lot of money. It had nothing to do with Smash. It would have been better. It would have been way better. Way yeah. better. Yeah. And I think that's something the movies do really well is that he's not involved in Spectre. Goldfinger is, is yeah. very much a standalone um, kind of character. He, he, he mm. operates in his own thing. I also think Goldfinger's yeah. plot in the movie is way better than the plot that he has in the novel. Of irra- plot. the irradiating yes. all the gold rather than trying yeah. to steal it. Yeah. yeah. On that yeah. note, there was again, similarly to from Russia and a few of the others, but there's a lot of a lot of Fleming's of the movie inventions came from this book, which I was pleased to to see. A lot of the movie inventions. Odd Job's hat. I was shocked odd by Job's that. Odd Job's hat. Odd, yeah. odd Job in general was cool. I thought <laughs> I kind of had a feeling Odd Job was going to be a movie invention. That's Same. what I thought. Um, yeah, but um, there was a few things. Pussy Galore, I was surprised. I thought she was also got, especially because she was introduced so late in the game as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, probably the coolest little adjustment was obviously our um, our laser table is now a circular saw. Yeah. Which yeah. Would, uh, I would have preferred that in the movie, I think, because it's more gruesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm it with is you, very actually. Messy. Yeah, but the irradiating the gold, you're right. That was, a, that was I kept, I was like, is this going to pop up? Or has he just got some stupid plan to barge in? Because it's a really kind of crazy plan. To be yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was never going to work. It never going to work. Well, that's what it goes yeah. back to your point of like, it just constantly in these Fleming books, you end up with someone doing something remarkably stupid and, yeah. and completely out of character because it makes way more, it makes zero sense to try and rob a bank. And I know he's got that monologue of like, look, Yes, it's more fortified and all this kind of stuff, but it is still a bank and all banks can be robbed. You know, Sing Sing can be broken out of even though they say it's, you know, impenetrable or inescapable. Mm. And I was like, that's a cool monologue and I like that, but you've got to have a better fucking plan. If your plan to rob <laughs> Fort Knox is just, we poison everyone within 50 square miles with sarin <laughs> gas. Yeah, because what and then we walk in and grab the gold. It's like, wh- where do you take it? What do you do with the gold yeah. afterwards? No one's going to get away. No. You know, you've got 50 trucks heading off in different directions. You've got a yeah. train full of... It's like, it's not, it's not going to happen, It's mate. not going to happen. And he's, he's already one of the richest men in the world. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it was a real suicide mission. You've got to, you've got to wonder if, if Goldfinger wanted out. Yeah. You know, if he was just like, maybe it, maybe that's the secret backstory. <laughs> See, Goldfinger actually was up to his neck. Yeah. Uh, well, he'd done everything. He'd sprayed prostitutes gold. And then he was like, I've, I've been to the mountaintop. <laughs> There's nothing else. I've seen. I've seen everything. Alexander seen wept. <laughs> <laughs> there are no more worlds to conquer. I know. It is oh, frustrating and... when they take so yeah. much time and pains to create a character that is so tactical and precise. Right. Well, he works himself clever. into a corner, right? Because he can't, he can't fix, he can't come up with a solution. As a writer, he can come up with a great problem, but he can't come up with a solution. Yeah. yeah. So it, he just rips it apart. You it know? kind of shows a lot of the weakness of Fleming as a writer, doesn't it? Because you kind of go, yeah. oh, you're not the that smart. Good. Yeah, you've got a great <laughs> setup. <laughs> but if yeah. you're going to write a genius, you have to be a genius. Like, imagine him yeah. trying to write Moriarty. <laughs> yeah, it was shocking. Yeah, 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 yeah. good point. His villain Moriarty goes dumb. into 
to Sherlock Holmes's office and blows it to smithereens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I and, did. Uh, I did love the 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 way that he'd set the book up into three parts, though. That was um, cool. I loved, and it being tied that to that um, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action. And yeah, then action, those three yeah. parts being called happenstance, coincidence, enemy action. I was like, that's good stuff, Fleming. And he tied fairly well those things thematically together in those um, in those three parts. Sorry, we're going to have to stop. Jake just coughed. Oh, uh, far uh, out, Jake. You didn't Are you hear me serious? Cough. I saw it and it distracted me. Oh, and it distracted oh. Brandon. Yeah, now you've distracted me, Jake. <laughs> Did not, you dirty bloody devils. Oh, we're going to have to start this etiquette. again. We're going to have to start Jesus this again. Christ. I'm not doing it again. I've already done it once. I can't even remember what I was talking about now, Jake. Thanks very no, much. I got... Well, so if I you can't that. remember it, it wasn't worth saying. Well, what did we think? Um, I don't, I'm jumping, I'm flipping and flopping and jumping around. Do it. But, uh, yeah. The... What, what another thing that annoyed me? I'll get into the things that I loved eventually because they were. <laughs> there it's were a few. it's more fun to talk about the annoyances. But like, a lot hinged on finding that note. <laughs> when uh, when oh, the toilet note <laughs> on the the toilet note, like a lot again, an example of the sort of uh, stupid. The pussy galore so toilet on. note on the plane. You mean? Yeah. Yes, Bond's trying to get a note to Felix to say Fort Knox, some shit's about to go down at Fort Knox because oh, obviously yeah. he's been cut off from all communication. And the only way he thinks to get this message out is by writing something when he has spare time, taping it to his leg, and then he takes takes a, a lavatory break on the plane and tapes it underneath the, the toilet seat. And he's hoping that somehow within three days, and he does sit there and doubt himself and, you know, Fleming tries to account for it. He goes, oh, it's going to be a bl pretty bloody slim chance that someone finds that. <laughs> but like... Oh, is it, Ian? Is it? Is it? And it what, turns out it what would have happened if no one found it? Like... <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that was the undoing of Goldfinger, a toilet note. <laughs> yeah, yes. Do you think that would have worked in the movie? <laughs> How do you film that? <laughs> And I don't understand because he puts it underneath the toilet and then he says, and every bloody man and his dog had to use the loo before they landed. <laughs> so who, wh who's not lifting up the toilet seat? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Yeah. Hello. They're all sitting down? <laughs> or they're pissing through the toilet seat. They're... Through, through it. Yeah. Through it's it. The main, it's the main part. It's, we're not talking the secondary. Oh, you think it's he just the... stuck it to the bottom of the main... Full cover. Oh, I thought Not he stuck it to the seat. You and think then the and secondary the... one? Yeah, because you've got the lid and then you've got the you seat the and then yeah. the yeah. toilet itself. And he so thinks on that the triple is decker, lift this one up. Yeah. He so he doesn't lift the the lid. All the men all the men have got the lid up, having a slash. And everyone has to have the lid up or else you just not everyone doing your business. Not, everyone. not in 1959 no. not in 1959 they didn't you've got to lift, lift the lid. lid up because that opens up the toilet no it's so just the lid's lifted but the seat is down I, so he's put it under the seat just a point right. of order on that if you've ever been into <laughs> a, a public toilet jake the yeah. touching that lid is disgusting i piss on the floor you <laughs> you just you just go lead. Normally what you do is you find a drain pipe in the corner of one of the stalls yeah. and just go straight. Absolutely. <laughs> You're an animal. <laughs> uh, no, it's a silly plan. It's a really, really silly plan. There's a lot hanging hey, on look, that I, toilet note. There is a lot hanging on that toilet note. I mean, look, it's a small gripe, but it is a Actually, gripe. it's a pretty big gripe it's, now that you think about yeah. it, really, because... Like you said, that's the only reason why Felix has any clue about anything. And I him know. turning up and, and like, you know, the whole ruse dramatic. of everyone falling down and, and playing up the whole idea of the gas and everything. That's right. I mean, effective and theatrical and, and very visual, uh, mm. very cinematic. Great for a movie. Uh, great for a movie. Um, but you've endangered some small children too, some uh, uh, some babies. Some yeah. You left them. Um just left them to cry 
to sell the scene. Whoever's staged that, I don't know if it's Felix or someone else in the CIA, but they've got, production, they've got production experience. They got Kubrick <laughs> in to do it. <laughs> oh, God. That's commitment, though. There's like, there's like, what about the car crash that they come across? There's a car crash where there's a body strewn out the window, and this is only visible via the train as the train comes past on the outskirts of the Fort Knox establishment. Yeah, they they see it. Some dead bodies. It's like, that's commitment. They've Huge. gone and damaged some vehicles uh, and got some extras to, to lay in some compromising positions and mm. no one's moved a muscle. And what's the timeline on this? How? What's the prep time to go out and total a couple of cars and stage an accident? Well, they had three. They had, well, it depends on when he got the toilet note. That's it, right? When did the actual... Because Bond gets off and the whole, and the whole Goldfinger party moves on, but then they, or maybe they explain how it all happened. But... Do you think... That if Ian Fleming were alive today, he would be a conspiracy theorist? Because I think to write something like that, you have to believe in absolute nonsense that the government could could orchestrate anything as complicated and as choreographed as that. I think Ian Fleming be, would be, be an QAnon. <laughs> <laughs> He's an anti vax Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Oh, no, I don't I know. Vaccines in the war. No, no. Yeah. I can never it's tell. Sound gas. I can never tell if he's just having a laugh. I, I mean, I don't know how clever the man is. I like, don't think he's got a sense of humour. That is, is something that I've piss, written or is as he a note that here. Dry and hard of a man <laughs> to take it all seriously. Maybe he would be a conspiracy theorist. I I think I he know. does take it very seriously because there's a couple of moments where like he attempt Bond attempts humor, like little one-liners at odd job and stuff like that. And they're all racist. They all result in him calling him an ape or a monkey or ape. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yes, think Bond, uh, he doesn't like those Koreans. Does and he? and much. Fleming has never really made me laugh. Like he's never made me go <laughs> I've always been like Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. I mean, you don't read these for a laugh. That's At all. A, a heck of no. good time, though. I, yeah, that's the thing. I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. I, I just don't really... I, and I'm finding this is the problem with a lot of the Bond films that I don't like and a couple of the novels, is that that third act is so bloody important and it when it feels kind of rushed and it feels kind of tacked on or kind of, uh, you know, there's, there's an event for an event's sake. I'm just like, ah, now I'm, yeah. now you've lost me again. I think one thing I've stopped doing with these novels, because I'm so, I think I've trained myself to kind of read and view things from the point of, uh, from the point of theme or controlling idea. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you try and figure out what the statement is and how it's all leaning towards that one thing. And I thought these novels were doing that as well, but they were uh, that type of story. And I think there's evidence to suggest that. And I think it's why I like Live and Let Die um, and Casino as a little, you know, duology is that they both are doing that. Yeah. Um, but anything thereafter... There's no hypothesis. There's no sort of controlling idea or statement other than bad guys are bad. Yeah. You know, that, that's essentially, and I just, yeah, it seems like a missed opportunity, but um, yeah, I've stopped looking for it. What about you boys? Do you think there's anything bigger no. at play in a book like Goldfinger? <laughs> no, it me. doesn't even really cross my mind, to be honest, anymore. Yeah. Of like, oh, yeah. what are we exploring this time round? Yeah. Because I think Casino had a lot to explore. Casino, yeah, 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 I think there was an interesting thing because there's so much of Fleming's personal turmoil going on. Um, yeah. And yeah I, when, when, when the character of Bond is an idea rather than becoming a, a piece of the furniture, when he was still an idea, I think there was a lot to say, perhaps. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, when he becomes... Yeah, I don't know. He's a bit of an everyman kind of action hero. Uh, a little bit he is this in... one yeah that's one thing you, you, in that last part that last act of this one i know he's done it in previous ones but i really felt like i was reading a tom clancy or a matthew riley book yeah. or a jack uh, uh lee child book it really 
and I kind of I did have a, a slight little moment where I was like, I think he did a lot of work, a lot of the groundwork for those, for that wheelhouse. Probably you know, of, of fiction, yeah, fiction writing. Yeah, definitely an influence. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's still, just not my it's still personal favorite genre. Yeah, 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 for sure. It's too, I don't know, guts and guns. I and think you lose sense of the geography. Yes, I find. Yeah. I, another thing that I find, um, and I know this is a complaint people have about the the movie Goldfinger, but I don't have it as much in the movie as I did in this, is that uh, Bond really doesn't doesn't do anything. Nothing he really does triggers the next event. The events are all triggered, and then he's c- caught in it. He's just const- It's in almost like he's reckon? yeah. He's constantly kind of like well along for the ride like he's captured for that final bit and it's just like now you're going to be my secretary and you're going to sit there and you're going to put a note under the toilet seat and it's all a bit kind of like Bond's not doing anything what's he yeah who am I focusing on do you know what I mean except for maybe I agree with you except for maybe the the sort of early part when he is trying at least to get under Goldfinger's skin I think the way that the way he works his way into Goldfinger is is very much reactionary we see his you know how his action causes a change in the narrative or whatever like um finding goldfinger cheating at cards at the hotel at the start and and things like that but yeah once he's i think it's about that time where he's kidnapped as you mentioned before bond definitely becomes just unimportant he's just the he's the narrator yeah. For a, for a yeah. story that's going on, you know. And and I loved the golf game. I thought the golf game was was a. Did you like that? Yeah, I re- I really liked. But I think I liked it because I like golf. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then I was also through that stuff. I was kind of like, what are we doing? Even though I was really enjoying it, and I was luxuriating in those good times, those golf times, uh, yeah. there was still a part of me where I was like. What am I learning here that I don't already know? I know he's a cheat. That's yeah. right. There's no new statement there, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an it's an odd um, thing. It feels like that's where the game the the game that's where the um the novel kind of it it has two starts almost. Like it's got that yeah. original Goldfinger mm. short story which borrows very heavily from Moonraker like you said. And then you've got all right, we're sending you off to look up this fella uh, he plays golf here. See if you can get a game with him. Like they're the same thing. They we it learn the exactly thing. Yeah. the yeah, same thing, right. and, and nothing else is I think triggered. We only find, do we find? I think it would all be if any. It's not story ex- exposition at that point. I think if we're finding out, because I think at the golf game you definitely no, you don't get it because odd job's not there. It's the other. No, party. it's Fuchs. That's it's right. Fuchs, yeah. What do you think of the scene at? It, the one thing it does do is gets us gets us to his house, but you don't need to have experienced the golf game. No, and and I think the golf game is is the, a big part of it is also to to um, service the once is happenstance, twice is coincidence. I think there's a little bit of shit. What's the second one going to be? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I right. guess maybe that's golf. the theme that he's working on. Fleming's going, oh, I've got this cool idea for a structure. You know, this idea of you know happenstance, coincidence, enemy action. Now I've got yeah, to create yeah, yeah. three things <laughs> where he <laughs> finds someone and then he finds him again, and then the third time he finds him, but he's bad, and then he captured him. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably how it went. I, I thought, it. although I did enjoy um, Screwball Bond at Goldfinger's house. Um, it was a bit dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Searching around and finding the camera and everything. And blaming it on the like, cat. Blaming it on the cat. Come on. Who is then fed to Oddjob. Fed to Oddjob. Yes. I yes, wrote that down. Come. I was like, is Oddjob given a cat to eat? He is. <laughs> He's given a cat to eat. And then, and then nearly given Tilly to eat. Yes. Oh yeah, the whole reference, the wording around that was like, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. That's when the the a lot of the the racist stuff started to pop up too. Where I was like, oh boy, oh boy, here we go, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> also the yeah. the fact that um, the reason that Goldfinger has Asian people work for him 
is because they're golden skinned. That's, oh God, I that's it. That. Yeah. Because they have yellow faces. Is I, I don't think that. Oh, well, that that passed me by. There that's that that was yeah the thing that's of he's obsessed we... with everything is golden. That's yeah, why he works with the Koreans and the Chinese and the the Japanese and and also the yeah, Korean right. and the Japanese being you know World War Two and Korean War enemies. Yeah, helps make them even less human. They're so kind of othered in this totally he yeah. does that a lot it's he does that a lot well <laughs> like that's he does fine. it to the germans thinking? way too much as well 100 percent. like you can't forget that in some form these books are propaganda like the fact that you know 1959 korea the korean pro, war pro was colonial 50, 50 to 53 yeah. was the korean war and this book comes out in 59 and all of a sudden it's full of like anti-Korean stuff. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. So it's like, he's clearly, I mean, he's obviously got connections to the, the second world war and intelligence and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, like you say, I mean, who's the, who's the enemy power at that time to England and the allies, the Western powers, you know, it's, it's, it's Germany, it's Korea, it's Russia you know we're seeing we're seeing these people uh, these cultures and races and stuff through the through the prism of of someone that used to work for the british government yeah exactly and that's yeah. that's an element that i must say to the film's credit they really toned down i mean look it, their arguments can be made as to whether or not that's still in the films and whether or not they're products of their time and whatever but I must say, you, Broccoli and um, Saltzman, I think they did a pretty good job overall of toning a lot of they that unsavory more, stuff more out of the tasteful. films. They were definitely more tasteful than Fleming. I way more tasteful than Fleming. There's... You Only Live Twice is, yeah. has got some shocking stuff in it. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but they, could have just, they could have very easily just straight adapted these books. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But they... I wonder if there's power in creating, like, Spectre and Smirsh, you know, like, the fact that we can create this other entity, mm. this, the stand-in that we can put all of that evil badness into whilst yeah, well, avoiding... It's the same reason, reason for, you know, some of the films they've had to use fictional countries. I think yeah, that true. Should, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know... I mean, yeah. it's hard. It's hard yeah, but it you is. Shouldn't... Because we live in a global stage, and and um, and he especially did at this time, and borders were pretty clearly defined. So I think there was a lot of animosity between nations. But when it comes to the point of being blatantly racist, you yeah, know yes. I mean? yeah, 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 just yeah, doesn't make much sense. Yeah, that's. I don't the... think. Oh yeah, you... I think he was behind the time, even at the time. Is my general. Feeling that's exactly what my question was going to yeah. be. I was going to say because yeah. there is definitely a sense of that was the the temperature of the nation at the time but there is no, a slight I mean, old pro- fashionedness even to the 50s i think in some of these passages and he's obviously got an awareness of a changing world i mean the appearance of, of pussy's all lesbian um girl gang what are they called the cement mixers mm, yes it's um although fleming doesn't handle it very well or in a very truthful manner yeah he's aware of it He's aware of a women's movement. Well, he's he's or definitely a, aware of it. He's, and he's, making, he's making judgment on it. But it just goes to show that, you know, the thinking at the time wouldn't have been... I think he would have been the, in a smaller club. Oh, 100%. Know. Like, 1959, yeah. like, the next We're decade... We're about to get the swing in the 60s, yeah. ...of that younger generation... Second wave to feminism do, comes Totally in trying to overturn people like Fleming. Yeah. Right? Like, those old... He says it's not to really... Don't be a suffragette. Yes. Or something yes. Like that. Yeah. 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 yeah he's but it is those that, little that, digs in. What do you do? You boys think? I know we've touched on it before, but I guess it's a clearer way of asking the question. Well, just to you know, we've learned a bit since the last time we may have touched on it. Mm. But um, can you make like if you'll do it, an adaptation, a period-based adaptation of of a book like this, mm. and 
you really try to make it faithful to the way James Bond thinks in that it is, he is a little bit racist and he is a little bit sexist and he is a little bit backwards because it's the 50s. Can you make that movie? Do you think you can make it? If you, are, if you have a perspective on a character as being, you know, I think it would have to be part of the narrative that he learns, you know, or, or that he gets close to learning that his views are... I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of that Archie Bunker problem a little bit, where it's kind of like mm -hmm. you've got a character who is clearly, you know, behind the times and thinks some pretty gross things. I I don't know. My gut says I think Bond feels like uh, something that became really strongly kind of well, very clear to me. I guess in this is that Bond really feels to me that it is. He's a real blank slate that whoever is writing him then puts their own perspective in a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, I think if we were to write it, it would be what our version of a gentleman is, minus yeah. a lot of that sexism and racism. And I think they'd still be... Because you don't lose anything by getting rid of that that kind of racial or sexual sexist kind of yeah hatred um yeah it's if anything it just clears yeah. the the path a little bit it makes it more accessible mm. it's less jarring that yeah way. i mean you can yeah. make you can make the film whether or not anyone will see it or if you'll work again is another thing <laughs> i just wonder if we're going to get to a period in in i mean I'm, we're in a very reactionary and sensitive age we are yeah. i just wonder if we'll be able to get to a time where it's a hundred years on from when this novel was written. And it's like the, the process is about adapting it literally, you know, and then, and then looking at that thing and then, and, and then going, what does this mean? Mm. Um, I just, I don't know. I think it's interesting because my instinct would obviously, you know, um, I'm like, I would love to make an, a book accurate James Bond film set in the fifties. You boys know this, our listeners yeah, yeah. know this. I think it'd be mm. kick ass and obviously as a modern storyteller, you would just tell the archetypal story and cut out the racist shit and cut out. But then are you making something that isn't true by well, doing I that? I don't think so, because I was thinking about mm. this. Um, I re-listened to an old episode of ours as well, because we've, we've kind of touched on this stuff quite a bit with these novels. We have, especially with uh, the novels. Um, yeah. uh, but I was thinking of that thing of like, no, hundreds of thousands of people marched with Martin Luther King and, you know, in these kind of civil rights movements with the, the second wave feminists, like it wasn't this small group that kind of popped out of nowhere. It was a long kind of, you know, a, you know, a long growing tide or whatever you want to call it. Um, I reckon, yeah, I, I think, like you said, I think James, I think Ian Fleming was definitely behind the times a bit and i think if you were to have a character that he wouldn't be perfect he wouldn't he couldn't it would be silly to give a 1950s character completely modern, modern sensibilities yeah um, it would still probably be a womanizer but you just make that a part of the exploration yeah yeah i 100%. think it's about again that we talk about theming and controlling idea i think a big part of bond is seeing the effect of extraneous adventures life life threatening adventures on the psyche you know mm, i think yeah. if you were to go back and and i think it's a part of my thinking for making you know doing a period version of these books is that you the, the character makes so much sense i think yeah like coming out of world war Two and mm. being in the 50s and having the tech as it is and being able to do the old spy stuff and, yeah. and all of that sort of thing it's all it all it all makes sense but yeah it just it was weighing on my mind i was like how do you how do you explore this today yeah. and you, can you have a character that is a little bit racist like like in live and let die when he sees a black woman driving a car in new york and he d does a double take can you just like without having the monologue written down can you have that shot reverse shot you know and base it on the the reactions of actors and tell that story you know, can you can you have in a 2024 version of a film of a story set in 1954 where James Bond arrives in New York and he sees a black woman driving a car and does, is a bit surprised. Can you show that? Can you do that anymore? I don't know. Well, yeah. I, th I think you probably could. I guess it's it is. It yeah. comes down to that the intention, intention as well, yeah. mm. whereas it's like mm. because I guess the, the fine line 
you know, whoever, you know, if you were to do this, who you would have to tread would be, you don't want the ultimate message to be, well, yeah, he's racist, but he still saved the day. You know, it's that kind of thing yeah. of like, you've got to be like, oh, it would, yeah, it's like, oh, wow, that's a woman driving a car. Okay. Good for, you know, is it a good for her? Is he ambivalent? Like, because if it is this thing of like, yeah. a woman driving a car, I think there is a, there's so much of that where just for audiences from about like the 60s on would just go, this guy's not the hero, is he? Like, I, I <laughs> yeah. can't, I can't get on board with that fella. <laughs> Well, he's an anti-hero in this version, you know what I mean? Oh, definitely. And I mean, that's that's yeah. the, the conversation yeah. around, like, the Dirty Harry films. Even when yeah, they came yeah. out. Yeah, he's a murderous bastard. And a horrible yeah. racist. And a and horrible a sexist. And, mm. and and I think the, the thing with those films, which... Because I really fucking love watching those movies. Example. But there is that, that struggle for me where I'm like, I don't think I'd like Dirty Harry, though. And... Yeah. And I know that there are people who go, yeah, but he's an anti-hero. You're not really meant to. He's not a role model. And that conversation comes up with Bond quite a lot online as well. It's about the viewing experience. But it's also like he's very clearly our hero. Like he has shots that, that make him look super imposing and cool and badass and like... Well, we need our heroes to learn lessons. It, Dirty yes. Harry doesn't, doesn't really... And he never learns learn the lesson. Anything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Where this conversation is taking my imagination is... Nobody cares. I'm, Shut up! Shut <laughs> Oh, God. You two are like a couple of old cats. Just keep on meowing. Can I get a word Come in your choice? Come on, get it out. Go on. What I'd like to do is actually read some of the Bond novels that aren't written by Fleming now and get a sense of what that Bond feels like because of this whole conversation that we're talking about, we've got all of these other authors that have contributed to this character now. Mm. Well, and we have, you know, I mean, we've got a bloody dickload of these still left, but we have spoken about doing like a run from like the Horowitz run or whatever it is. Remember, Brando? The, Horowitz, the, the two Horowitz ones are the ones that I'm most interested in because they're mm. set in the Fleming era. Uh, ah. uh, before be one, Casino huh? Royale, so oh, that no way. Yeah, so they're kind of set before. I think one of them is set before, and the other one is set after. I'm not really sure. I know the Chandler novels are kind of like Bond in the '80s. They're very much like, and and then kind of uh, with Gardner and all that. Or I think I might have mixed them up. Gardner and Chandler. I can't remember which one. But like, if they were writing okay. during Brosnan's era. It's pretty clearly a clearly a Brosnan era Bond. I think right. Gardner yep. actually adapts Goldeneye and License to Kill actually. Um, so yeah, they're kind of they're very of their time as well. Mm. And uh, from memory, I think I've only really read one Gardner, but I have a memory of them being very, very Tom Clancy, Matthew Riley. We're gonna do this. <laughs> <laughs> Get it done. See yeah, us. Yeah, let's yeah. roll out. Yeah, right. Yeah, because yeah. that's the other thing. It's it's like what what's the makeup of Bond in the in the world of the novels as time goes by? Like we've really only met the man in his own time with the original author in the in the late fifties. What happens to this character in the eighties from a literary standpoint? Just well, I guess they do the same thing as the movies, where he's kind of just becomes a timeless entity. And they yeah. ignore the fifties canon. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Because I mean, having a new author is just it's the same as having a new actor. It's like that author is just going to put in their own baggage, their own stuff, their their own style of writing. It's gonna. Oh. I mean, you can put his name there as the character, but it's gonna completely change the. I would imagine it would completely change the whole flavor of the person personality mm. yeah it's what were your change oh sorry no no no, no. I, I was just gonna no, say no, it's, no. it's the thing that i i'm really loving is that he does feel like a very kind of blank slate character i i the more and more i like it was i think it was a question we had when we started the podcast which is who is james bond 
Yeah. And I thought I had, a, at the start, I would have said a very different, I would have had a very different answer to what I think now. I actually don't know if there is a lot to Bond. And I think that that is kind of the brilliance that, yeah. and particularly with the movies, an actor can bring their own personality a bit to it. And it re- it's yeah. like the Doctor, really, in in the Doctor yeah. Who series. It's very much like the Doctor is a magical time traveling wizard who is very knowledgeable and can can fix nearly everything. And it's played by David Tennant, you know. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, and I feel like Bond is a little bit like that. Um, where, yeah, I'm kind of like you could do the story of Goldfinger. You could even set it in the fifties. But the actor that you cast, the the person who writes it and the person who directs it, their three personalities then color bond in. Um, yep. And I think this this kind of... I, I definitely have said this on the podcast where I'm like, oh, I, I wish they'd go back to their Fleming roots. I don't think that anymore. Now that I've really closely read these, I'm like, no, the, the stories, the frameworks are cool. The, the plots and narratives, they're great. Not I don't need Fleming's personality on screen because I've got so many other artists who can bring things to it, you know. Mm. That's why I'm so fucking excited for Kerry yeah, Fukunaga's it's a, it's a, version of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a deep it's a deep, deep topic. I mean, oh yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. because like my mind flashes to literal sort of like I love I love the way Fleming writes shots for example so you, you could argue that there's a lot of dna of james bond in his visualizations you know i think yeah. you could really you could really go down a lot of different routes with trying to analyze i think but you're so right i think it's definitely i think contextually obviously bond isn't a blank slate when this was written no definitely but, not this is the only version of him at that yeah, time which isn't. yeah that's right it's the, yeah but um yeah for sure i think it's a great way to think of him and he's an archetype. He's just, a, he's definitely just an archetype. Yeah. You know. Because it was funny. You, the, the bits that made me bristle in this was like when he yeah. was like, I'm on an on a airplane to heaven and I wonder <laughs> if Vesper is there and what she'll think of this new girl. Oh, I'm like, God. you've known her for two days. This is bullshit. Don't hammer this shit in. This isn't backstory. <laughs> this isn't personal growth. What is this? An airplane to heaven oh, and Vesper's God. there. She broke your heart. She betrayed you. Come on, grow up here. <laughs> You're not dead. Oh, the shoehorning of Vesper in actually starts to make me go, enough. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? I get it. Your girlfriend's dead. Yeah, we want some continuity, but not shameless callbacks. We can yeah. never be pleased. We can't That's be pleased. That's the lesson. Yeah. That's the lesson. <laughs> that... Although, I, I do want to ask, what... Do you boys have any sort of like, uh, I guess, honourable mentions? What What did you love about this book? Colonel Smithers. <laughs> Smithers. Colonel Smithers at the bank. Love him. <laughs> Hang on, Colonel Smithers at the bank. Yep. Oh, the the Col- old the the Colonel the expert Smithers in gold. runs the kind of like secret guards of the Bank of England. He's a gold expert. But he also coaches the the work women's hockey, hockey team, team on the weekend. <laughs> Which was so arbitrary. <laughs> it's just See, my inner storyteller was going, cut it. Just cut it. It's yeah. not <laughs> I love the line, Colonel Smithers looked exactly like someone who would be called Colonel Smithers. <laughs> <laughs> he had me at that. You lazy yeah. git. <laughs> yeah. No, look, in all in all seriousness, um there is a quality to Fleming's writing. And it's probably just trickery, but I fall for it every time. And it's this whole kind of, um, I don't know, I guess it's the, the idea of a renaissance man. It's knowing a little bit about everything. I just really enjoy getting lost in some of these stories sometimes when he goes into random details about, you know, like building structures or like the chemistry of like rare metals forming or, um, yeah, yeah. you know, like um, self-defense techniques or things like that. I was like, yeah, you should know a little bit about everything. I was and... quite impressed during Smithers' uh, uh, gold, his little thing about how gold works. I was like, well, Fleming either is 
blowing shit out his ass or <laughs> he's done his research here? That's the thing. It's like, yeah. is the research process for him super intense or is he just like flying yeah. by the seat of his pants? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just need to know more than the reader or appear to. Because <laughs> yeah. that's the that's the that's the Flemingisms that that I that I really love. You know, when Dupont and Bond sit down for that for that dinner and, and the crab comes out and the butter is poured and the wine's flowing and stuff, I'm just like, yes, yeah, yes. This is this is Bond stuff. I love this kind of stuff. That gentleman that, sophisticate. Yeah, the, all of that kind of, that gets me more excited these days than um you know oh what what's the bad guy's plot because nine times out of ten it'll be something that we've already seen or it'll be ridiculous or you know and this idea of you know bond eating eating out on another man's dollar yes he can (laughs) can kind of ah well you know if we're gonna (laughs) i loved that (laughs) where he was a little break yeah he's like looking around going lucky i'm not paying for the room <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's more than my week yearly salary yeah because that's one thing that i often forget is bond isn't a rich man no though he, though he uh yeah. you know he hangs out with quite a number He's that's pretty, the pretty um pretty that's the trick of it isn't it it's like you assume mm-hmm. because of all the kind of opulence with bond oh bond you know bond is champagne bond is cigarettes and fine dining and yachts and sports cars and all this kind of stuff but he doesn't earn he just gets to enjoy that stuff he's one of us yeah yeah he's a workman yeah we just pay for it yeah exactly (laughs) that's right (laughs) i i will say actually on one one thing uh because i know that the the hugo drax and the goldfinger comparisons are quite quite strong both cheating at cards both you know the richest men in the world i really liked that bond was not like awestruck by Goldfinger and that he had quite a few passages there where he was like oh righto mate you've got enough money like there was Mm. this the obscenity of of extreme wealth which is such a 50s thing it's pre the 80s where it's like greed is good it used to be it was like oh good lord you don't need that much money donate Mm. it Mm. like the the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers you know why did he just hoards gold? He hoards money like a dragon. Again, that St. George and the dragon stuff was popping up yeah. again in it. Um, yeah, the hoarding, he was just like, oh, it's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. He doesn't use it for the public good. Shouldn't have it. I was like, wow, that's such yeah. a different v- reaction to what he had yeah. with Drax. Whereas yeah. Drax had that public facade of, well, I'm building us a rocket. Yeah, what was he was in awe of Drax because of the, the the war heroism, wasn't it? That was the main thing. Drax was a war hero. Yeah, and and that he was a, such a brilliant mind. Yeah, he was. He yeah, was yeah. constantly going on about it. He, oh, he, he is a truly brilliant man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which he says. That's right. That that was the book where, although it's a great book, that that was dumb bond. It was dumb bond. It was a little bit of dumb bond in there. Yeah, yeah dumb bond at the dinner party. Rosy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he does say that about Goldfinger, though, quite a bit, where he's like, oh, he has to be brilliant. He has to be, you know, he's so calculated. He knows exactly what he's doing, mm. but he's not won over by it in this version. Yeah, I guess that's a little change in character. It is. But again, I can't remember if it's because Goldfinger has a bit of, is it German or Swiss heritage? Because it's times they're like, oh, well... We thought he might be Jewish, but turns out he's not. And it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think it's All ever right. underlined what, what he. <laughs> oh, I have a feeling it is because well, they talk about him being naturalized him. after the war. Oh right. To England, he can because he, he, he is an Englishman. England. Yeah, he is an Englishman, but, but he was naturalized from. Oh God. Because Drax sad. was German, but he hid it and took the identity of another person. Yes. That's right. No, I'm sure they talk about Oryx origins. Hey, Jake, that's one for fact check. Oh, yeah. There you go, Jake. There you go. Tell you what I loved. Oh, What's yeah. that? Photographer Bond. Oh, the Leica. Oh. I couldn't stop thinking about you. Hey, quick question. <laughs> was that the correct F? I know you weren't seeing the light, but by the way he described it, was an F11 correct? He was going for a pretty deep focal throw. Um he set the he set the camera to one one hundredth of a second, 
with a light meter. So it's a, it's a more rudimentary light meter because I, I thought light meters gave you the f-stop these days, but he got his shutter speed. So I was a little bit like, oh, okay. But what I did like was, so yeah, he's gone for like quite a deep focal throw, which probably suits the day. I think it's oh, good. Okay. And what I loved more than anything was Bond considering his composition. <laughs> yes. when, he, when he got up in a chair very quietly, but in the, in the back of the room so that he could get Goldfinger down on the chair and, uh, and Jill Masterson in the foreground with her binoculars, he was like, oh, that's quite a lovely shot. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, it is. That tells a story. <laughs> when does he get that developed? <laughs> Instantly, apparently. <laughs> it, well, there's a couple of days where, like, he uses the identigraph. Why isn't there a photo of Goldfinger anywhere? God knows. There's not, because I mean, he crafts one with the identigraph, He uses the, right? the Q's little... A thing. nose, not a banana Q. Not a Q. <laughs> yeah. That's all I can think of. I think, I think that's where they got that scene from, because there's a line in there. Oh, fuck, I can't even remember what it was, but there was a line about the face, I and I right. was like, that was yeah. in For Your Eyes Only. I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I think um, he had a few days when he got back. To, to sort but of, he sort take, of, sort of, take the, it to the chemist. He's on the radio and he's like, "If you try and kill me now, I've already sent this photo off." But he hadn't. No, I think he's bluffing. He's bluff. But surely Goldfinger's bluff. like, "I'm also a band from the 1950s. I know how cameras work." <laughs> <laughs> That's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That was a cool yeah. moment when. Goldfinger is able to seemingly kind of like barrel down the the lens of the te of the binoculars and like just oh, stare yeah. him down. I was like, that. Why is that not in the film? Put that in a movie. Oh, That's... What what happens? Does it in Goldfinger when he gets made when Bond speaks through? He kind of he doesn't look he he he. In the book, he's very like oh he's very calm and that, but in the film, he's like. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, it's got to be this. <laughs> you're very small in the shot. We've got to make it obvious. Gert, bigger. Darling, bigger. Bigger! <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of really cool visual, visual moments in this one. I really liked just one that popped up into my head much later in the novel, but I want to see it in a Bond film where he's pretending to sleep. You know how he oh, yeah. pretends to sleep to try and, try and get yeah, the fake snores in a nice rhythm to try and get Odd Job more relaxed. That's and then right. When he realizes Odd Job's asleep, he tries to keep the rhythm of the snores while getting up and stuff. I was like, that's pretty cool. I was so surprised, uh, spoiler alert, that we don't actually see the golden painted lady. No, we just hear it, no, don't we? Just reference. Yeah, it's only told to us by a sister. And I, I was glad that, just words, uh, that Tilly it? hung around. You know, you but were she, glad that Tilly hung around. But she doesn't around? do anything. Nah. She doesn't do anything. None. She, he completely screws the pooch with Tilly. Well, she does, but you know, yeah. I mean, Tilly's death is the stupidest death oh, I think damn. he's written of one I of want the to girls. Be pussy. Yeah. yeah, give me pussy. Uh, yes, we get yeah. it. She's a lesbian. Yeah, it's not her inclination, James. Yeah, yet he just wasn't willing to come out and say that she was a lesbian. He can be so blatant and such a dickhead about everything, but he can only allude to maybe, maybe Tilly doesn't like men. Or <laughs> That's the only reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's really just thrown aside. I was trying to. She made. She reminded me of someone else. Who? Did, who, who else does he does it? Does he do that too? Where the, the the female character just gets in the books. He's sort of building towards something in the books. Oh, and then he but Tiffany and then Tiffany just... Case becomes Tiffany, useless. Tiffany Case, same thing. Yeah. When yes. we get to that climax and he's got too many moving parts, he's like, forget it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Women in the corner, please. <laughs> I'll save you for love making on the last page. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Pussy Galore <laughs> is the she. I think she's like the shittest character in this. What book. a stitch up! What an it's not even an up. attempt to like justify her name at all. There's not. There's nothing. She. Mm. Uh, she. It, it, 
it could have been anyone. Could have been any gangster. Literally yeah, I mean, could have been anyone. On. There was a big leap in logic there for that rug pull, the second climax rug pull, and Goldfinger's actually flying the plane. Yeah. Oh. Hey, the airport's fairly empty, guys. Where is everybody? <laughs> They're all just getting their shots. Can you come get your shot too, Mr. Bond? All right, then. <laughs> oh, I've had so many <laughs> bloody shots for all these different things over 20 years. When the shot's gonna end? <laughs> come on, sir. You really should get the shot. Oh, all right, then. <laughs> And also that Goldfinger admits he's like, we got pretty lucky because our, our the the plane taxied in the right direction. So uh, here we are. <laughs> this is supposed to be the guy that wants to be the king of crime, the the greatest yeah. criminal throughout the ages. And where's he going? He's he, he, he so this is where he's going out. to he Russia. Work for Russia, Smash and he's flying Bond to smash yeah. but yeah. that ladies and gentlemen is a bridge too far for pussy galore and she's like i don't want to go to russia no thanks i'm gonna be <laughs> with the good guys now and guess what i don't think i'm a lesbian anymore <laughs> essentially that's the that's yeah. the you just haven't met a real man <laughs> <laughs> you're right uh, uh. This book has dropped down in my estimation. Come on, you bloody ruined it for me. You always do this. <laughs> it does happen. I love oh, the plot. But that first half, it's very Brandon. It's it is very. very. It's to me. It's to me yeah. at points. Yeah. In fact, I felt pandered to, actually, at points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is he watching me? Wrap right this now? golf game up. This is indulgent. <laughs> I love it. I did think... For a time, I did think he was going to describe ev all 18 holes. Every hole. That so course. did I. I was <laughs> very getting concerned. very worried. I was getting very worried. Oh, I tell you what, though, on that golf game, I yeah. loved that neither Goldfinger or Bond were exceptional golfers. Yes. I was very impressed that he had a bit of restraint there, that Bond wasn't a complete straight shooter and that he had bad shots and that he allowed Goldfinger to be played back into the game a bit. I was like, yeah. that's yeah. good. That's good. But ultimately, it was a bit indulgent. <laughs> I was like, what? I, I loved Bloody it. hell. No, Jake, I'm talking. Oh. <laughs> All right. Cut. All right, go again. Go on. Continue. Well, mine was a tangent. So are you speaking of the well, same Well, mine point? is not a tangent, Darby, right, well, because I like to stay oh, on topic. Here we go. Brandon. Yes. Do you know what a spoon and a brassy is? Oh, the golf shots. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think a spoon. Okay, this is good for fact check. Uh, a brassy, a, shot, right? a brassy, I don't know, but a spoon, I think, is the old style of wedge that they used to have. They don't have them in the game anymore. Um, mm. And and you would, it was kind of like spooning the ball kind of up. You just kind of got under that it. Goldfinger puts through his legs like a croquet player. Oh, oh yeah. 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 And Bond says that that's the new style. As is the style at the time. You know yeah. what it reminded me of? The old broomstick putter. I yeah. thought someone had a broomstick putter and was kind of like <laughs> putting backwards. <laughs> Whoa, their legs. Yourself, yeah, yeah, stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we live. <laughs> Okay, can I save my point now? No, 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 because I'm going to say one final point on the golf. One final point on the golf. Well, yeah, we should wrap up the golf. Bond, yeah. Fleming. well, rather, I should say, Brandon yes. plays golf like James Bond. Excuse me? How's that? Because Hawker, the caddy... Bond's <laughs> not a kooky lefty, though. Says okay. No, Bond's not a kooky lefty. But the caddy says We don't to know Bond, that. He doesn't say that he plays right-handed. True, true, he doesn't. It's not... Oh, I wonder if you could prove it. Fact check, mate. I don't think yeah. anyone was allowed to back then. Though. Yeah, yeah that's they, true. they'd take your hand. Devil! They didn't make left-handed like clubs. Hawker the caddy says to Bond, can you still put them on the roof of the starter's hut? Yes! <laughs> and that's exactly what Brandon did <laughs> when we played at Cumberland. That's right. I put the bloody... Oh, from the final hole, I was, I was like 50 metres out from the green. 
and uh, the clubhouse is behind and it's about 150 metres back and I've taken a shot that should have gone 50 metres and fucking smack banged it. It was the uh, loudest... I wouldn't know because I never bloody get invited. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was the loudest bang I've ever heard on a golf course. It was deeply embarrassing. This was like four years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm still Lucky haunted they're renovating by that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That... Uh, any more golf chat? We done? Uh, I've been Garvey. watching a lot of the golf on KO, actually, not a sponsor. Maybe you should get a set of clubs. Garvey, yeah. And then you might be invited. You only need four. You don't four. want to see me play sport. You only need four. Golf's a game. You need a, you need a, a driver, an iron, a wedge, and a putter, and that's, that's it. That's it. Yeah. I'll drive the golf cart. All right. You can All be right. our caddy. Speaking of which, segue. Oh, yeah. Oh. What did we think <gasps> of the vehicle? The Aston Martin. The Aston Martin DB3 yeah. in gunmetal grey. Is this yeah. the birth of the icon? I know it's not Has a DB5. To be. Has it's to be. It's battleship grey, I should say. Yeah, battleship grey, but that's the same as the DB5 that he drives. It's... I, I, I think it's the The DB3... Grey. Uh, does not look very different from the DB5. Oh, it's a gorgeous car. Gorgeous. It definitely looks more from the 50s. It's like the 50s version of a DB5, for sure. It's got a similar sort of shape. Google it. Have you Googled it, Jake? Have you checked no, it out? No, I the haven't. Mm. Oh, I, I Googled both that and I Googled all the cars and all everything that he talks about in period, and I'm just like, I have no idea what that looks like. And I'm always surprised. It's such a weird time. A strange like, time for, for vehicles. <laughs> Yeah, this does. Like the other thing about this really beautiful. feels like a car book. A car. I mean, there's so much emphasis on the DB3 and, and yeah, the guns. Yeah, but they're made. They're kind of integral, and they get brought up a lot. It's not we do spend a lot of time over. traveling in this, like just sitting down in a moving vehicle while someone pontificates. Oh, who else got a flash of um, No Country for Old Men with the long range scanner? Oh, yeah, the homing the long, beacon that he puts rage. in the car. The car, you know, you can, the homing beep, beacon, he can hear the beep, 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 Oh. Beep, beep. Yeah, when he's chasing yeah. him across Europe through France. Yeah. yeah. I, I think was they... so stuck in Goldfinger world with that with that movie. With the little Suddenly? beacon that he has in his shoe Maybe that he then in the shoe. puts oh, in right, the right. boot. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yes, we're talking about Goldfinger, Brandon. Keep up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, what about you boys? Uh, what are your uh, honourable mentions, Day Players of the Week? I bloody Favorite said it, mate. Bit. The camera, the car, the... Oh, I've got it. My Day Player of the Week is Goldfinger's anti-smoking quip about how he oh. says, how ridiculous would it be if you saw a cow gather a bunch of hay and start puffing on the smoke? He's like, yeah. what a ridiculous human pursuit. Yeah, yeah. And again, another example of that crazy bloody detail that Goldfinger kind of expounds on the reasons why he doesn't drink. All of those different poisons that he's found that are in the in the different alcohols. But and then he says, but then he says, but uh, let's get some vodka and uh, filter it through charcoal, a known carcinogen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Activated charcoal and brush your teeth with that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, in, yeah, yeah. It's in everything now. Great. What about you, Brandon? Any any uh, honourable mentions? You just said. Well, my end is making quit. I will say, actually, just to give the the novel its due. Shush, Jake, please. Um, <laughs> it's very it's very hard when you do this in the room, but it's even more so uh, on on the delay the throws everything off. Oh. Uh, I Continue. thought the sim- Continue. Stop. Go. I thought the simplicity of the plot was a good strength for it. I didn't yeah, think... What about any honourable mentions? Uh, well, it would be my smoking quip, but the simplicity... Because <laughs> I, it, that's a tick. It's an honourable mention to Ian, to old nobbies. Um, because I find sometimes he tries to overcomplicate the stories a little bit, and I'm yes. like, wrap it up, wrap it up. Just, we're here for pulp. We're here for pulp! Give us pulp. That's all we want. That's all I want. 
Martinis, Nothing girls, and guns. That's it. oranges with extra pulp. That's no it. fruit, just pulp. Not a sponsor. Uh, I actually thought it was cool that the Spangled Mob was there too. Well, they, they did get a mention. They weren't the Spangled Gang anymore. The Spang Gang. Yeah, they so were they must have had a structure. I think they were subtle rebranding. I think they were called the Spangled Mob. I think we called them the Spang Gang. <laughs> we might have come up with that. <laughs> that feels a very Trey Bond universe. <laughs> You're right. You're right. That does ring a bell. I, think yeah. I don't know whether Ian's sitting there going the Spang Gang. <laughs> He's a humorless fuck. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think they're called? I think they're called the Spang Gang. I love it, Ian. <laughs> Thank you, Noel. <laughs> That's all the notes I've I've got. Yeah. yeah, look, I think, you know, I think it's time to get to our summaries. Isn't it interesting, though, if one final point, that um, Fleming plugs we Chandler. No, we were, but we're not yet. Fleming plugs Chandler. Yeah. Right at the end. It's so, like, Bond goes and picks up the latest Chandler novel. That, Trying to help a mate out. That was Fleming just being like, please like me. Please keep liking me. Yeah, because he was friends with Chandler, right? They were, they was trying to be even more. They were chums. Chandler. What, do you think they were trying to be bum chums? <laughs> oh. <laughs> they were more. Sounding a little like Fleming. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> you think they were trying to be more than chums? No, 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 no. Mate. Well, I don't know. Maybe Fleming is um, repressed and wanted to share his feelings but couldn't well that's that's what they say isn't it the most bigoted people have repressions <laughs> i thought it froze <laughs> hang on i have to click my mouse <laughs> no he hasn't frozen and He's that just... <laughs> wow that's really good wow <laughs> Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the living statue. <laughs> we know, do we have any idea? Because I know for the films, we were I've pretty honoured when it, when it came to... Jake. <laughs> when it came to uh, knowing what our, rank, what our ratings were of the films, you know what I mean? Like, oh, what did I give Live and Let Die? Oh, yeah, that was a, an eight. Oh. I don't know what I've given any of these. Books. Oh, yeah, I couldn't gauge it. I've really just been kind of, you know shooting in the dark here, trying to score a novel on its own merit, I believe someone uh, once told me was the way to go about it. Not worrying about <laughs> oh, what yeah. your past yeah, yeah, yeah. numbers were. I think we said it, so uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. If we check. said that, then it's yeah. true. Absolutely. Any, <laughs> so, anything, everything I say. You shouldn't be worrying about what you gave your last novel. Just I can go, go first. I'll make it easy. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a six. A six. Yeah, it's very. What solid. do you give the first half? Oh, the first half is is an eight. Yeah. First half is back an eight. Half's a four. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the back. No, the back half is is a six, but such a dense six that it that it. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> It's so dense that it has its own yeah. gravitational pull and thus makes everything a six. It's well, fine. I have a little it's more fine. logic. <laughs> it's it's top, half. <laughs> top half was a nine. Back half was a five. We've come out with a seven. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I can go a seven. Make I can seven. swing a seven. There you go. Um, what about Sinead O'Connor? It's... <laughs> Um, Who do you think Sinead O'Connor is? I don't know. Because <laughs> you've been going hands. vogue every time you said this. I just it's like not, to do the hands. Yeah. It's just really like dramatic sort of singing. Yeah. Like really okay. feeling it. Every time Darby you said Sinead, you compare? Yeah, I know, because no, that's just more interesting than doing like... Compares. No. no, I don't know that one. I know the name. You could burn a photo of the Pope. She did that on Saturday Night Live. Did she? Yep, live on TV. Has she ever done yeah, a, a sample for a Bond film? Has she been in the running? I don't think so. Awkward. <laughs> All right. You really derailed that, didn't 
<laughs> Am I to blame? Darby brought it up. Darby is always to blame. Fact check. Uh, my. <laughs> That's what my parents say. My. <laughs> Darby knows not the time. Um, my number for this. Let me see. Um. Look, I look. 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 I enjoyed this. I enjoyed the first half, as I said, more than the second half. But I'll say it again. Yes, we both I said enjoyed that. the first half <laughs> more than the second half. And what am I going to give it? Look, the, the chances are... Give it your best shot. The chances <laughs> of me picking this up again are very slim. I think... Look, never say never. You didn't pick it up in the first place. <laughs> yeah. You Stop know what saying I mean. that. <laughs> I will probably never say never though, but I will probably never consume another <laughs> Ian Fleming novel once I've read these once. I think the never. replay value for me is quite low. What if what about if we wanted in fifty years time to Trayvon revisited and Darby, a bunch of if old I'm fellas, still friends with you in fifty books. years, I will mm. well Let's just say, hopefully, I don't live that long. So you'll die a happy man because you will have been friends with Darby and me until uh, your dying day, and we will uh, have both outlived you, even though we live way, way less healthy lifestyles than you. <laughs> now, Jake, you know I'm going to call yes. call bullshit on that because you have What's expressed that? many times before, maybe even on the podcast. I believe I so too. Your belief that you you could potentially live forever. Yeah, second. You have oh. a, you have a legitimate well, belief actually, that you may that's... live forever. Yes, I do actually have a legitimate belief that I will live forever. I think uh, the work of uh, Harvard professor David Sinclair uh, <laughs> is quite incredible. Uh, I think we'll be 3D printing our organs by the end of the decade. Um, I give Goldfinger an eight. Hey, you bloody, we an eight, okay, whatever. Jake, you uh, you got married between episodes. Yes, by the way. you didn't let anyone know. Oh, I did you too. are you are now you now Mr. Wood. Oh, yes, Miss, I am. Mrs. Spear, yeah. Mrs. Spear, uh, that is me. Um, praise be. Praise be. We were there. You guys were there. We were, we were there. there. We were standing standing beside you. Yeah. You were. Had you to fight off me? the had to fight off the paps. No, this is a yeah. private event. Please. I know, the tabloids were climbing over the fences they trying were. to uh, tap us all. No, it was good. I ate all the cake. I, I saved no leftovers for my wife. She was very annoyed with me. Honeymoon um, in lockdown. Yes, yes. It hasn't been the greatest honeymoon. I think actually what's going to happen is that the honeymoon will... <laughs> Leanne will go away separately, away from me, uh, <laughs> to spend some time alone. <laughs> Get out of my life. Well, congratulations to our to our one and only Mr. Spear. Yes. Oh, now Thank Mr. you. Spear. Thank you. Thank Congrats. you very much. Oh, that's pretty sweet. I said it on the day. I'm just doing this for the podcast. This is just for the people. I don't yeah. care. The novelty's worn care. off for me. Oh, marriage. Oh, yeah, yeah. No one's done that before. Ago. Oh, come <laughs> on. <laughs> Who's next? Darby. Look out. Yeah, next October. Dun, 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 dun. Anyway, this might be cut out because this is all babble. Let's no, go. no, I like to keep this stuff in. This is the you stuff like I keep. Oh, I cut this... the reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this is, yeah, this yeah. is why people stay. This is what they said at the start. This is why people stay. 100%. Number one podcast in the world. All markets. Yep. <laughs> I don't know where you're getting this. I'm getting this Can from... I, see? I keep getting emails from people who are like, you are the number one podcast in the world. You have the most listeners in the world. Fan, and if you pay $15 a week, which I do, you will stay the number one podcast in the world. <laughs> Mate, I, uh, I, I think... We are doing no, no. We are doing that without having even released. We've released two episodes this year. So they're I've, just telling. They're just Joe Rogan releases that, weekly. Yeah. So does I would all stop of paying them. that money immediately. No, we are the number yeah. one podcast in the world. Not just James Bond. Not just movies, television. The world. Oh. <laughs> Mickey Rooney. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
What are we done? Yeah. <laughs> We're cooked. <laughs> We're, we are. What are we doing next time? When is next time? Well, we'll see. Pause. Oh, Where's he gone? I thought he would never leave. Hello. Should we? Let's just sit out of frame for when Almost. he comes back. Should we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. These, um... Jake, I can see your arm. What? No, you can't. Oh. What about now? You're good. Okay. Oh, they've... Yes. Well, you can pop up now. Yeah, there they are. There they are. Hey, there you go. Hey. Oh, we played a little trick on uh, you. You played a little, little trick. trick. Just a little sneaky trick because we disappeared when you left. So That's right. And you... when I came back, I thought that you had, had gone. We'd left you. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. What were you doing? I was going to find the um what the categories were for the top fives that we have left. Oh, oh. we're doing a top five, are we? I think so. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I couldn't find them. You didn't find them. I didn't find uh, them. Oh, okay, so right, so right. what we could do is yeah. um so I could, I could cut this bit out and not show it to people. And we could, we could pretend to be mysterious and be like, next week we've got a very special episode for you. Something you've never seen before. This is the number one podcast in the world, Trey Bond. Something like that. I would just use that. I don't think we need to run it again. Oh, I could just, yeah, run the audio of that. Just and, use that. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds pretty good to me. Suckers. 15 bucks a week for this. Can you believe it? Bargain. Bargain. A week? A week. a week. Yeah, yeah, a week. US. 15 You've US your a week. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because oh. they've got your card number and stuff now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Lucy was concerned about the... She was like, $15 a week? What's what's going on here? What's this? And I was like, don't worry. This thing's paying the bills. Is it? Are we generating any money? Not yet, but we are the number one podcast in the world, so... But you would think that there'd be something out of that. I'm kind of kicked back with sponsorship or... Well, I think eventually Spotify will be like, these guys are the... We sh should have spent $100 million on these guys. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 